before, uh, but all of you are close. So let me give you encouragement to reach around, walk around, say good morning, welcome each other in the worship of God. Let's continue our worship. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Worship, Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. holiness. Tremble before, before him all in the earth. earth. Let's sing.
be seated. I invite you to enter into a time of prayer and just open your heart to the work of the Spirit, for it's the work of the Spirit who convicts us of sin and righteousness, who tells us this is where you're not where you're supposed to be, who tells us this is the way to go. And like all of us humans, all we have gone astray, so it's time for us to just take a moment and clear away, confess the things that stand in our way of meeting God this morning. Let's pray. Our gracious God, hear the silent reflections of hearts, our response to your Spirit's calling, our desire to be fully accessible to you. Hear us now, Lord, as we confess our own personal sin. Lord God, we come knowing we need to confess, confess our brokenness, and we ask for the brokenness of the community, of the nation, of the world we live in, for we do not exalt your purposes and your value. We proclaim an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and may the strongest win. We proclaim it's okay to wound other people if we succeed because of it. We accept lies in place of truth. And we have allowed other gods to fill our lives, to guide us and to lead us in place of one God. Power, influence, ego, stand in the way of being your people. We ask your forgiveness, God, as a people, as well as an individual, for all the things we have tolerated and participated in that wound the people you love, the places you care for, the purposes you're about. Lord, you have heard our silent prayers. You know our hearts, our desire to repent and to be restored. So we ask your forgiveness in the name of Jesus. Amen. The scripture tells us that God so loved the world. It's not the perfect world. It's not just the Christian world. It's God loved the whole world so much that he gave his only son that whosoever in that broad whole world would believe in him, we would not perish. We would not have the destiny of our sins, but we would be restored and have life everlasting before God. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ, your confessions are heard and you are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's sing our grateful response.
the silence, new hopes are blooming. God is at work, God is at work. Will you pray with me? Oh Lord, as we come to your word, we ask that you will open us up. Even as high notes and low notes and piano and organ all blend together to make a glorious sound before you, may our ears now be attuned to the glorious sound of your voice, to the work of your spirit in us, calling us, charging us, comforting us, challenging us. Lord, we surrender this time and our hearts and minds to the work that you're doing in and through us. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we are continuing in the second half of our account of two disciples as they journeyed that first Easter morning. They're walking away from Jerusalem. They're walking to a village, the village of Emmaus, that's not a long ways away. They're walking and discussing everything that has happened, everything that Jesus has done, the crucifixion, and now this message that they have gotten that Jesus is alive and the tomb is empty. What did they make of all that? It was something that they couldn't quite believe, so they're walking away, and someone joined them and asked them what they were discussing. Indeed, the remarkable thing is that these disciples told that stranger everything. We talked a bit about that last week, but I want you to note this as a mark of a disciple. We tell others what we know, incomplete as it might be. And in this case, these two really didn't know who Jesus was or what he had done. 
They thought, well, he's a prophet. He's the Messiah, but that hadn't worked out like they thought it had. So who, who was this Jesus? What his death meant? What happened next? Those are all big, big questions that they couldn't understand. And still, they told this fellow traveler all that they knew. This is what we knew about Jesus. Would, would you be able to do that? If someone came to you and, and asked you, what are you talking about? What are you believing? What does this mean? What could you tell them? What would you share with them about who is this Jesus in my life? It turned out that their temporary traveling companion actually could shed a whole lot of light into Jesus because it was Jesus himself, but they were not allowed to see him. Now, before we get into the scripture this morning, I want to pose a question that's been kind of rolling around in my mind for a while now. Why did Jesus choose to walk with these two? Why did he choose this revelation to two men walking on the road? What does that tell us about God? These two weren't part of the leadership team. They weren't the elite of the 12. So, so why them? Why, why not appear to Peter and, and the rest of the disciples, the leadership, all together? Jesus could have revealed the startling news to everyone all at once, but why this deliberate unrecognizable encounter on the road to nowhere. Perhaps the message is that the message of resurrection is too large, too big, and unexpected to really comprehend all at once. Could the disciples even get their heads around that message? You know, later when Jesus finally did appear to everyone in verse 37, it says, they were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost. They didn't get it right away. And for some of them, it took a number of times and a little bit longer for them to comprehend. It was hard for them. And truthfully, it's still hard for us centuries later. Here in this text, we're actually getting to see the journey of belief in two people as they come to recognize Jesus and accept his resurrection. It's a remarkable picture. It's a remarkable privilege. It tells us God is willing to take the time needed for us to make a realization because he doesn't want anyone to have doubts. They, in this case, needed to be sure for this conviction would cause many of them to suffer death and danger under persecution later in years to come. The fact of the resurrection is now guaranteed in this encounter by the witness of the scriptures and the recognition of two witnesses. It's a fact that we can turn to even today. Am I a little bit loud? I, I hear a, okay, it's just my head. <laughs> Thank you. Well, all that tells us that God honors the reality about us that each one of us have to come to a conclusion about the resurrected Jesus for ourselves in order to make any difference in our lives. In his book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis uh, addresses God's methods when he says, he cannot ravish us. He can only woo us. Why would God need to woo us? You know, like, like a lover woos a lover. Why, why that? God has so much power. He's so magnificent. He's all everything. Why does he need to address us in that simple way? Because God doesn't want conversion driven by fear of his majesty, of his power, of his might. God doesn't want us to be robot believers. Yes, yes, this is right, I believe. God doesn't want us to go along with what the crowd believes. God wants our heads and our hearts. That's where it comes from. That's where belief comes from. And God will not force anyone into faith. It's important what you and I think in this journey. 
And thus Jesus engages these two disciples in the most amazing Bible study ever. God wants us to be reasoning, growing believers who are convicted in our hearts and minds that the resurrection is true and that we need to follow the risen Jesus. These former disciples now are about to become a new kind of disciple because beforehand when they followed Jesus, they really didn't know who he was. That's how it worked. Their insight into him had to grow and had developed over time and lessons to begin to understand. But now, in a discipleship relationship with the risen Jesus, it only begins when we know who Jesus is in our hearts and minds. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a a good teacher. He's not just a miracle worker. Becoming his disciple today begins with this belief that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is resurrected. He is alive, and he is our Savior, paying the price for our sin. And then all that truth compels us in this journey of being a disciple. It's a relationship. Today, we know who the resurrected Jesus is. That's our foundation as Christian disciples. Our growth in what is in the area of what place he has in our lives. Our text today is back in Luke. Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 25. You'll find that on page 1611 in your pew Bible. Hear now the word of God. This is Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while, we were, while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So they got up and they returned to Jerusalem at once. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. May God open our hearts and our minds to his word. The Greek word that we translate as disciple is the word mathetai. Think of Matthew, mathetai, a disciple. A disciple means a pupil, a follower. But it's not a passive term. It's not something that suddenly comes on you and you are a disciple. It's something that you do. In a discussion with dads this week, we were talking about this passage and trying to define that, and they came up with the words of apprentice or emulator, which I think are helpful because they imply some kind of active, growing, engaged relationship with Jesus. In those days, rabbi uh, disciples were basically absorbing, taking from their rabbi his teaching, his actions, his behavior and attitude for their faith foundation. But then they were expected to grow, to move beyond the rabbi and apply his teachings to their life and make it a real part of who they were as God followers. Growing was not an optional. It was the goal of discipling. It's kind of like what's happening in our own family. 
This Easter, my son John and his wife announced that they are pregnant with their first child. Oh, that's exciting. It's thrilling beyond words. We're ex really excited for them. But that is only the beginning of this journey. For now, our future grandchild has to grow and develop before it can become vital and be born and survive. By the miracle of modern technology, they sent us a picture of this little one. It's this grainy sonogram. You know those pictures? And somehow, some people can look at them and figure out what's there, who's there. But that's not where our grandchild is going to stay. That's not what that child is going to be like. They, we, we are designed to grow as human beings. Growing is built into us in order to have life, to become whole, to become mature, the person God would, has made us to be. And so it is with discipleship. Being a follower of Jesus, we were made to grow. Being born into Christ is wonderful, but it's just the beginning. Being born again is like that grainy sonogram. It's where we start, and it holds so much promise for the future, but that's not all we were meant to be in Christ. It's not the final person God has made us to become. Disciples are designed to grow. And that's why in Jesus' day, those disciples would follow their rabbi around and learn from him. They didn't have books that they studied. They'd walk and they'd talk, maybe sit under a tree. They would follow and learn the scriptures. And how do you interpret them? They'd see the belief in God and how that changed what they observed of the world around them and understood life. They learned the traditions, the festivals, the law, and the prophets of the Jewish faith. And over the years, they began to reflect the rabbi. In fact, there's a blessing which basically says, may you be covered by the dust of your rabbi. May you be covered by the dust of your rabbi. That means that the closer you got to them, the more time you spent with him, the more of his dust you walked in, the more of him you in absorbed, you became identifiable as his disciple. Discipleship with Jesus is a dusty way. The Apostle Paul describes himself as the apostle of a, a renowned rabbi, of one who is well respected all across the community, the Rabbi Gamaliel. In Acts 22, verse 2, he says, under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. The dust of his rabbi can be seen in the disciple's life as he applied the lessons. And who understood scripture more, trained in the law of the fathers, and more zealous for God than Paul? So whose dust is on you? Who's teaching shapes your life. Who's leading are you following? See, when Jesus questions his disciples here on the road, he's actually, I think, testing the dust on them. In verses 25 and 26, he's challenging them about an important lesson they seem to have missed. What the scriptures say about me? He said to them, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe. Doesn't that sound like a teacher? <laughs> Doesn't that maybe sound like a parent? How many times do I have to tell you? How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? In other words, they hadn't put the scripture they'd learned into practice in their lives. If they'd remembered those lessons from the prophets about the Messiah and what had to happen, they wouldn't have been in a quandary now. They'd perhaps even have understood what happened on the cross. You see, you can be a learner, but not be a disciple. You can study the scriptures, but not know Jesus. You can hear great sermons, be in stimulating classes, read wonderful books, watch creative videos, but that's no more than entertainment if you don't apply them in your life. 
Jesus went on to explain to them how the Scriptures revealed him and what had to happen. Can you imagine that class? Can you imagine the lesson? It's a master class in Bible study by the master himself. Imagine what that must have been like when he, he started going through Genesis and said, this is about me. And Exodus, this is about me. And Leviticus, this is about me. And Numbers and Deuteronomy, the whole Torah. And I think it had to blow their minds when he started opening the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel and Amos and Micah. The Psalms and the Proverbs. Weren't our hearts burning within us, they said, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? How foolish it is when we think, well, we're a New Testament church. I, I only need to read about Jesus in the New Testament. The Old Testament doesn't apply. Funny, Jesus didn't agree with that, did he? It was in the Old Testament that he is revealed as the Savior of us all. Both Testaments are equally important as a disciple. We can't act like tourists and just check out the high points of the Bible and be a disciple. We are called to take up residence in the Scriptures and go deep so it, it changes us. It grows us. As Jesus' disciples, God's word is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, and it cuts through a lot of things, doesn't it? I think I've spoken to you before about how my father came to faith when I was in high school. My Marine Corps veteran father was seeking truth and meaning for his life, and he didn't want anyone else to know it. So he would get up at four in the morning just to read the Bible. Because he knew in his wife's life and somehow in his 16-year-old son, the Bible was important. The Bible was powerful. And then when we would go to church, he didn't want to go with us, but he'd turn on the TV and watch a TV preacher because he was seeking. He was longing for something. And, and I don't know what he read in the Scriptures, and I don't know what he heard from the TV preachers. But I do know that Jesus opened his heart the way he opened the heart of those two disciples. Scripture answered that longing in my dad's life. And it changed him. My mom would say it saved their marriage. Dad became a disciple and was committed to the dusty way of following Jesus. How about us? Have we lost the way? Unfortunately, the only dust that some of us see is actually on the Bible, a sign of neglect of those very scriptures in our lives. That's, that's not a new thing. Renowned 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon was adamant about the value of being in the scriptures. It was essential for a disciple. He wrote, there is enough dust on some of our Bibles to write damnation with your finger. Is that harsh? Too harsh? The American Bible Society creates an annual report called the Status of the Bible. They reported in 2021 that 50% of Americans said they read the Bible on their own at least three or four times a year. Three or four times a year. That's the bar. And it had stayed that way since 2011. But in 2022, only 39% of those surveyed said they read the Bible multiple times a year. That's 26 million Americans stopped reading the Bible regularly. And that was during the pandemic. What else did you have to do? And the figures haven't changed much in this year's report either. But the question comes to us, are those 26 million Americans out there or are we a part of them right here? Do we turn to the Bible out of habit, out of need in a crisis, I need an answer, or out of hunger for who God is and what God is doing in our lives? Theologian Soren Kierkegaard 
noted, when you read God's word, you must constantly be saying to yourself, it's about me. It's, it's talking to me. The Bible is that transformative. Just look what happened on that road to Emmaus when Jesus' comprehensive Bible study, those two disciples determined that this fellow traveler is someone we want to be around, not just kick him off when we reach our destination. And in perhaps the most consequential action of them all, they invited him in. They insisted that he stay with them. And inviting Jesus into your life makes all the difference in the world. Even if you don't know everything about him, we all receive as much of Jesus as we know when we invite him into our lives. And then he starts to reveal himself more and more. It's a lifelong journey of discovery, growing closer to Jesus. Disciples want to know him better. Their hearts burn for him. In the simple act of breaking bread and giving thanks, they suddenly recognize Jesus. The same Jesus who gave thanks and broke bread and fed 5,000. The same Jesus who gave thanks and broke bread and fed the disciples at the Lord's Supper. The same Jesus who gave thanks and broke bread over countless meals they shared among the disciples. He was clearly before them now. These two who didn't know it all, disciples who had lo- thought they'd lost their leader, discovered the one that they had invited in was actually the one they wanted, the one they longed for, they hungered for. And they couldn't just sit still. Disciples just have to tell others about the good news. And suddenly, that road back to Jerusalem, that nighttime road that was dangerous and precarious at the time, flew under their feet. I don't think they even thought about the risk. They had a message they had to tell the others. Dr. Stanley Hauervoss of Duke University writes, it's hard to remember that Jesus did not come to make us safe, rather to make us disciples. Citizens of God's new age, a kingdom of surprise. What greater, more surprising message could there be to give our family and friends but that Jesus is alive and wants to love us? What greater opportunity do we have but to become disciples of the living Christ and to share his life with others? Becoming a disciple takes time and effort. Growth doesn't just happen. And yet we were made to grow if we dare. And when we dare, it's an adventure like no other. It's really an act of love in response to one who has already loved us. What could be better than that? Where are you on this dusty way? Whose dust covers you and defines your faith? Which way are you headed? We are called to head to grow as disciples. Will you pray with me? Oh Lord, as we bow before you again, may your word roll around inside of us. May we have time to reflect and consider what it is you're calling us to, not church membership, not just conversion. You're calling us to life. A life of growth. A life of challenge. A life of change. A life of confidence and assurance and value as individuals that's found in the resurrected Jesus. In the strength of this message, Lord, we, we know Jesus is alive. And we follow him. Guide us, Lord, to be more faithful in our following. Open the scriptures to us. Give us that that endurance to have to go again and again and again into your word until we hear it. Holy Spirit, lead us. And may today be the day that we start. Yes, Jesus, I will follow you. Yes, Jesus. 
I believe you are alive. Yes, Jesus, you have taken away my sin so that I might be your own, your disciple, your apprentice, your beloved. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Well, now we have the opportunity to be the family of God to one another, to share with each other both the joys of our life and the concerns that are upon us. So what are your joys today? How can we celebrate God doing great things in your life? And how can we support you as you walk through some hard times, perhaps? Yes. Say that again. Prayers for... For Max and Roberta, who lost their daughter, Jody, Jody, to suicide. Hey, let's pray for them right now, shall we? Gracious God, we lift up to you Max and Roberta, parents who are surely brokenhearted, who don't understand, who don't see what their daughter did as at all freeing, it puts a weight on them. I pray, God, that you who are gracious to Jody, even to the last moment calling on her, that you had a better way. Indeed, you would greet her and welcome her as your beloved. I pray for Max and Roberta as they struggle today in the shadow of what's happened. Be present with them, Holy Spirit. Be their comforter. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Other joys or concerns today? Yes. Uh, my daughter, Connie, is still in convalescent. And she's not really improving, so please keep in her prayers. So your daughter, Connie, is convalescing? And I missed the second half of that. What, and she's convalescing? See, in, in where she is? Yeah. In Oceanside. In Oceanside. So prayers for Connie as she convalesces. All right. Other joys or concerns today? So prayers for Takesha as she waits on the result of this biopsy and prayers for all the doctors and technicians who, who see that through, that they will be wise and understand what it means for her life. It's such a hard place to be, right? In between the test and the results. So lift up Takesha in that, that place. Betsy? Okay, Uh, Betsy had eye surgery, and uh, the doctor said it's healed, and now she's waiting for little adjustments in her vision, but she's thankful to all of you for praying for her and supporting her in this time. Amen. Other joys or concerns today? So Sydney is in Oregon at a party for your grandson's fiance. Is she a bridesmaid? No. Okay. She she's up there celebrating. All right. 
Other joys or concerns this morning? I thought it was a wonderful sermon. Well, good. Thank you. That's a joy to me that, <laughs> that the sermon was well received. Other joys or concerns? Wayne. young tomorrow and we celebrate that and we're grateful I've heard many many comments on how grateful they are for Lynette's concert for uh, the music she put together and man just wait till she gets well and she'll really kick it <laughs> but we're grateful thank you for, sh for sharing your gifts other joys or concerns today yes All right. New shoes that let you walk without pain. Well, I think there's some people here who understand that a lot. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Who knew shoes could be an answer to prayer? How about that? Yeah? I think there's one other joy. I'm going to tell you about it now. Um, yesterday... At 12.01 a.m., Elizabeth Marie Naish was born. Her parents uh, attend mainly the first service. We baptized their two children about five months ago. And uh, so uh, Dave and Lindsay have this new little girl. And today, the 14th, is actually the birthday of their daughter, Eva. No. Tomorrow. Tomorrow's the birthday. Great. So the two girls don't have to share a birthday. <laughs> Is that an answer to prayer? Yes. Amen. Everybody gets their own birthday. And uh, if you would like to be part of the, the, what do we call it, a food tree? Meal train. I knew it was something in there. The meal train, who will be taking meals to the Nash family over the next couple of weeks, would you contact my wife, Carol? Uh, and she's nodding in the back row. Um, but she'd be happy to organize that and set that up so we can support them on their journey with this new little one. So that's good news, exciting news too. All right, let's go to God in prayer. And if there's anything in your heart that you can't say out, and I know we always have those things that I'm not saying anything, but say it to God. All these people up on the screen here are folks that we have, that you've submitted their names to be prayed for. And I want to invite you to continue to do that, to pick a name and just let that be your, your prayer partner for the week. Just be praying. You don't know what's going on in their life, but intercede for them. Lift them up before God. Let's pray together. God, we bow to you. For you are God, and we are not. We, we lift up to you these silent prayers, the petitions for people in our lives, or even the names on the screen today, for ones we don't even know, but we intercede for them, God, from the heart. Hear our silent prayers. God, we come to you because we know how good you are. And we've heard the testimony of that today from Betsy, whose eye is healed and 
vision recovering, and we thank you, God. We thank you for the skill and ability of all those surgeons and who, people who ministered to her, who drove her around, who cared for her. Thank you, God. And thank you, God, for the gift of music that Lynette brought this last weekend. Thank you for a concert which touched hearts and minds. Thank you for the healing process that you've been working in Lynette's life. And I pray for complete and whole healing. Thank you for Wayne. For 88 years, you have gifted us. I pray that the, each of these years may be full and rich, for he has walked with you these years. Lord, we thank you for uh, new shoes that cause no pain. It seems so small, but it is so incredibly important. Thank you, God, for making those shoes available and the wearer happy. We lift up to you family, God, as, as Sydney is up in Oregon at a celebration for her grandson's fiance. Thank you, God, that the family can gather and that they can welcome into their life this new member. And thank you, Lord, for being more than we imagined, for bringing the Lord of new life. We thank you for Elizabeth Marie Nash. We pray for David, and we pray for Lindsay, that they, as parents, they go through this amazing shift in their lives when now their children outnumber them. Hold them up. Give them strength. And may each gift of a meal be a gift of love to them. And Lord, in this assurance, this confidence, the support that we have, we want to lift up to you, uh, Max and Roberta again, remembering them in their grief. We want to lift up to you, Connie, who's in, in her convalescing in Oceanside. And we pray, God, that you would be about knitting together her body, restoring function, enabling her to again be whole. And Lord, we pray your special presence, your spirit upon Takesha as she waits for the result of a biopsy. And all the fears and what ifs, we lay them before you. And we pray that you will give her peace that surpasses understanding. Come, Holy Spirit, and be present with her. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings, a sign of our faithfulness and love of God.
to your angel. Thank you. So a couple of announcements for you. The first is today you may still buy tickets for the spaghetti dinner the Women's Fellowship is sponsoring. This will support their, uh, their mission work. It is a spaghetti dinner and a bingo fundraiser. So bring your own Parmesan cheese. No, I'm sure they'll have Parmesan cheese. What's spaghetti dinner without Parmesan? And then uh, enjoy friendly church bingo. Friendly church bingo. And uh, just have some good fellowship on that. That's Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 20th, from 4 to 7. So again, uh, remind you of the birth of uh, little Elizabeth Marie. And if you'd like to connect in the meal train, Carol is the one to talk to. She'll be out in the narthex with me. And f- finally, I just want you to know that is there any cake left? There's a cake out on the patio that... John and Pat Liam brought today, celebrating their 69th anniversary. Now, John was not feeling good, so they had to go home. They didn't get to enjoy it. And I'm told it said, happy 70th anniversary, but they're so optimistic. So if you know John and Pat, send them a note. If there's cake out there, please eat it. Uh, And just celebrate the, the good gift that God has given them in one another. Let's stand now and sing our closing hymn. Now I invite you to join in our benediction, our blessing, and if there's someone near you who's willing to hold your hand, go for it. If not, then just lift your hands and we will bless each other, shall we? Now go in peace and bless the world. And remember, you go nowhere by accident. 
Where you are going, God is sending you. And where you are, he has placed you. God has a purpose for your life, right where you are. Christ Jesus, who indwells you, has something that he wants to do in and through your life, right where you are. Believe this and go in his love and in his grace and in his power. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.